Welcome to Outright TV, a video and podcast series bringing you stories of LGBTIQ people and allies across the globe as we face this pandemic together. I am Sonia Cotton. I'm the uh, UN program intern. And today I am talking to Kelly Eve Kupman from Cape Town, South Africa. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you for having me. So uh, I have a lot to say about Kelly because I met her in 2011 and I want to say all the best things. Um, you know, she's a, she's, <laughs> Kelly is just all the adjectives and is the most talented person uh, I know, but I will let her introduce herself. Um, could you please describe yourself to me however you like in about 30 seconds? Wow, that's that's so hot. Okay, I'm timing um, at thirty. I'm I am 30. okay. So my name is Kelly. I am a writer. I am an artist across many disciplines. I um, consider myself someone who, in all their work, cares about social ju social justice. Um, and I work with an organization called Fem Projects which um, is a feminist organizing platform and we do some work around SRHR and I also have a platform called Color Mentality along with my partner Sarah Summers and then yeah that's who I am. <laughs> Thank you very much um, and I apologize for closing a, an arbitrary 30 second timeline on that because um, no that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Um, so Kelly, at the moment, what is happening around you with COVID-19? Um, so in South Africa, we're on our third week of what's very aggressively being called lockdown, which is like legitimately an enforced, um, I suppose you'd say quarantine physical distancing period, where um, if you know even a little about South Africa, you might know about the massive kind of race and class disparities we have here and how very different people's lived realities and living realities are. So this lockdown means very different things depending on where you are. I have the privilege of living in a very nice home near the ocean with my partner and my dog. Um, so while obviously quarantine is difficult, it's not as difficult as it is for many, many other people, such as homeless people, for example, who have recently been corralled into a tented camp regardless of the many storms we've been facing and regardless of the fact that they're unable to even physical distance within it. We have an uh, extreme like kind of police and military presence that are criminalizing this. Law. Hello. And I'll close off. Yeah. So if you want to know where we're at, so if you want to know where we're at now, South Africa's 21 day lockdown was supposed to end tomorrow. Today, it has been um, postponed for another two weeks. So yeah, we'll see how we manage. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, and I can really relate to what you're saying about being in a more privileged position while the country kind of burns around you. Um, I've read about the situation, the, the camps where they're taking homeless people and it seems really violent and brutal. And um, as a South African who I, I often find myself very feeling the sense of, of bewildered, confused guilt about how good I have it compared to how Bad, other people have it and I imagine that must be very exacerbated now um, so I was wondering if you had any kind of coping mechanisms or any kind of tips for dealing with that kind of ambiguity I think it's like it's to realize well for me it is to recommit to understanding that the situation we have is by no means in any way normal or justifiable like pre-COVID or should in any way exist. And um, in the new realities that emerge, be really active in not only trying to provide some kind of relief for this moment, but in trying to really like grind on imagining the next and, and like making sure that this doesn't have to be South Africa's continuing, continuing like exacerbating reality yeah. that you can live in like two different planets 
in one space. I mean, it's like absurd. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like the ultimate code switching. Um, yeah. I, I was interested. I know you're always doing so many things, whether it is writing a whole book um, or <laughs> your work with Femme Project. Um, and I'm interested in firstly what this pandemic is doing for the kind of work you're planning, but then also how the pandemic is changing the kind of work that you want to be doing. Yeah, so this is it. like, so um, Sarah, my partner and I have been talking and working around a lot around, uh, around doing like m imagination work or like this question of what is the world to come and how do we make sure that um, as people who believe in a just agenda as opposed to an unjust one, how in our work and in our art and in our activist work do we ensure that we're actually like building into that beyond also just beyond just responding to this moment because like with the work we do with fem at the moment right rightly so is raising funding for relief work for various feminist activists queer people like queer activists um the refugee community various you know like from kind of a feminist base people who are trying to provide essentials during this time which is really important right but it's like it's also not just about the relief kind of work that we do in the now where it can become very much about replicating the same hierarchies of like donating what you can and but keeping those same kind of divides in place um even while trying to support spaces that obviously don't have essentials so that's like a, par a paradigm or dichotomy to work with is how do we not so much try and fix and prop up this system that we forget about creating another one and so i'm finding myself like balancing between those kinds of worlds in the organizing space which is also why working or thinking in an art space and trying to merge those two um like arts and organizing is is for me something i want to like push more toward because i think there's real potential there to be grounded in social justice principles but to be free to imagine something better That's and work toward it that makes sense yeah absolutely yeah. And that's really, really exciting. Um, and I often think that especially when people think of the kind of relief that they give to like Africa, it's just about like, it's just comes from this idea that we need to just give them resources, you know, just like g g give them things. But what you're suggesting sounds like, like full on imaginative labor to do the work to create something totally new. Yeah. Yeah, not and not to say that people obviously like need things now for survival, but we're not just like nobody is just a survivalist being, nor should be reduced to that. You know, like, yeah, it's not a sustainable way to engage. Yeah, it yeah. sounds it sounds like very very humanistic. Um, yeah, yeah, and I I also know that in your own work, I think in your book. Um, and just kind of my sense of what you do, you grapple with the various type intersections of your identity, uh, kind of in the local. And I was so interested because I feel like in this pandemic, a lot of people are using these international platforms like Zoom, like we're now talking across Zoom and, mm. you know, and, you know, the, it feels like there's this tension between between local and global. And do you think that the way that people who can be are suddenly very connected, do you think this could change the scope of what it means to belong to a community? Like a global community? Yeah. Again, I think that depends on like who you're speaking to and from the position of, you know, because like, there are not many South Africans who have endless um, access to data. It's not free, nor is it cheap. So, like, that's a huge divide in itself. So, until that's not an issue, you will have one portion of South Africa that's part of, like, a quote-unquote global community and a much larger portion that isn't. So, so you know, like, it costs something to be connected. It costs a lot. Yeah. So, it's another so I think... Mm, mm. Um, and... I'm interested in whether you would think that coping, the way people deal with this pandemic can be, is, do you think the way people cope with it is specific to regions? 
Um, it's, I don't know, like, so my partner Sarah has this interesting WhatsApp voice note project called Inside Voice, and it's basically collecting voice notes from people who are having different experiences in wherever their homes are during this pandemic. And like, I've been listening to it, it's really interesting and like really, it makes you feel less alone. And while there are like obviously vast, vast differences in terms of social realities, there are also a lot of similarities in terms of like anxieties for the future and, you know, emotional worries and like spiritual concerns and like, you know, so, so I'm not trying to eradicate the massive divides that exist, but I think things like mental health and spiritual well-being um, is like important everywhere you know and also like that's another thing it's not like you get like massive amounts of funding to do like esoteric work that's about spiritual well-being in like <laughs> under resourced areas because suddenly people become like like you said like reduced to like survivalist objects that require some kind of like just donation to like survive whereas that's not true of any of us you know so I think like work that stretches across encompassing all like the aspects of like what is the basis that we need to be human you know or like all of us is important to consider when like surviving through this and hopefully connecting with each other differently afterwards like I, I hope we will have learned something about what we need to survive not thrive but to survive as human beings which includes human connection like you don't think about that as like an essential need but it is so yeah absolutely um and i feel that yeah this isolation kind of strips a lot of things down um to what those essential needs are for example uh like connection have you found anything that uh in this time has actually been really important to you that you never knew before this isolation Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I think like just the ability to move, you know, like just to be, like to not see the same thing all the time. Like this sounds, it's it's such a bridge. Like to like to be faced with the exact same like um, physical environment every day. I feel does something to your mind, like, <laughs> like to move, to like walk around, to be migrant, to like live in different spaces, to occupy different spaces, I feel like is, gives you a lot of mental energy. Um, and so, yeah, I realized how, how, how I'd like to see different things in front of me, I guess. <laughs> I don't think that's a basic human need, but I mean, it's something. <laughs> I know how you feel. <laughs> I <laughs> um, and then I have one last question for you before I'll just kind of open it up, um, which is you mentioned that you want this to kind of change, you, you want this to kind of change the way that we relate to one another, that you, you're thinking a lot about what COVID, what the post-COVID world will look like. And I was thinking if you had anything more um, tangible about the ways in which you want the world to look once this is over. So what I will say is that I think what's firstly important to note is that it will change nonetheless. You know, there's no such like thing as going back to normal. But I think like I am interested and concerned about who will be in charge of how that works. So I think what's happening right now is that there is a lot of like civil organizing energy, right? There are a lot of networks existing and there are people like supporting each other and giving across various networks but these are still like in the vein of like let's survive this together that focus like let's get through this and then let's get back to kind of some semblance of how things were like i think that like the first like it's a really bold and like scary step to try and detach yourself from how things were completely and not try and build, rebuild the society according to that blueprint. I, I'm still like in the process of trying to do that. So like figuring out what your guiding principles are and what the, the world, like what, if you ask yourself honestly, what would I imagine as better? It's actually a hard question to answer. Like you, you could probably like tick off a few boxes and like answer from your like political base. But like, if we're going to hand power back into the hands of 
the government and in South Africa into a system that continues to replicate the disparities we live with and are only growing on the daily, I feel we, have, we will have missed the opportunity here. And um, again, though, this sounds very idealistic. It's also very possible that things will first get much worse, <laughs> which we also need to be prepared for. Like, I think this idea of like, oh, at some point it will pass and then it will eventually get better. Hello, Sarah. It's a guy. Um, no, <laughs> but I'm finishing this question and then you can come in, is a fallacy. And, and, and like, that's the first, I suppose, lesson. And then having as, like the boldness of that, it, that's ephemeral, but still the, the boldness of, of detaching from the old blueprint is for me like a big lesson. You can come in now. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, where are you? I'm in New York in my apartment. We're we're being recorded. Oh um, shit! Yeah, but New York is hectic. Sorry, it's hectic down there, isn't it? Like ground zero, like batshit crazy. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Sorry, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, I think um, just. To quickly get back to Kelly's last point. Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't even finish. Oh, oh my bad. Don't, don't leave, Sarah. But about your last point, oh. that's just, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate that sentiment because I think so many people, and myself included, hear how terrible it is and we can't imagine a way out of it. But realizing that that, that element of it getting worse might be a necessary precondition for. Come back. Yeah, come, come okay. back. Um, <laughs> And so my last question can be to you or uh, Sarah, if you feel up to chiming in, which is just, um, do you have anything else about how you're feeling that you would like to add that I haven't asked? So do you want to add something here, please? <laughs> no, but I said a lot. I really would like you to. I, I think I said, a lot. <laughs> no, don't be shy. I'm not shy. Sarah's going away now because she believes I'm shy. Um, what I have to add, I suppose, is that let's keep the same energy, but be willing to use it differently. <laughs> um, like let's keep the same, get through COVID together. Like because it can be so survivalist, right? Like this is really cynical, but like sure like mobilize when your own life might be at stake and also mobilize when it is still in your favor like you know that you will be better off by like giving donating civil organizing during this time because you will be inadvertent advertently preserving your own life like that's like it's good energy to to try and leverage what you have mm -hmm. but like not only <laughs> under the circumstances where you you are scared of where you might be scared of like being infected by a global disease mm -hmm. and also not only like when it suits your own agenda to trying to protect your own privilege i suppose so yeah yeah same energy different direction <laughs> And that sounds like something that I think people who've been doing activism in South Africa since fees must fall to, you know, anything that have been frustrated about that suddenly when something affects kind of the, the, the like, the people who have the, kind of like the upper middle class, then there's action, there's mobilization. But I feel like a lot of people who've been trying to organize have been saying stuff for years and years and years and without much success yeah. uh, or politic, public sympathy. Um, Kelly, thank you so, so much for taking the time. Thank to you for having me. And this was Outright TV, a podcast and video series. And uh, my colleagues and I will be back with you with more stories soon. Thank you.